Hey there, Dirtbike people. I'm Chuck from True Tech, and today I'm going to be doing a top end on my EC300 TPI. This is a 2023, so it's the last year of the TPI. It's an EC300, as I said. We've got exactly 100 hours on it. I'm actually going to be doing a variety of maintenance on it, but I want to go riding Sunday. It is now Friday. I'm going to do half of it today and half of it tomorrow. We'll split it up into videos. This one's the top end. Now, I put the TSP ECU and head medium compression on at about 35 hours, and then at about 50 or 60 hours I put in the injector relocation kit so I've been running that. I've made a ton of mapping changes it's I've gone all over the map so I really don't know what to expect with my piston. I've got the bike really hot. The hottest I saw was 263. It's been all over the place so I'm really curious to see what the top end looks like. I just washed it the other day. It's been sitting in my yard it's so hot and dusty here right now. It's supposed to be 38 degrees on Sunday, so plan to go for a ride at 6 a.m. to beat the heat. So I've got enough stuff off here that you can kind of see what's going on. I have a whole bunch of stuff here that is different than stock. Now, I'm not gonna film all of this, but I'm gonna drain the coolant. I'm gonna pull this stuff out. You don't need to see that anyway because yours is not like that. Mine's the only one. Okay, so here is my spark plug. Let's see if I can get a better shot of that. Say it's pretty good. There's definitely some buildup on there, so I'll be replacing it, but it's not too dark, not too light. Like I say, I've gone through a lot of jetting changes. And this is the BPR8 EIX that came with the TSP kit. All right, I've got everything out of the way. Head coming off. This is the first time that I've taken this TSP head off, so oh, a little bit stuck. Just thread the spark plug in there a little bit. Ooh, that's interesting. All clean except right around the front. And this stuff is like stuck on there hard. So if you bring the piston up here, you can actually see all around the top here where it's been contacting that ridge of deposits inside the cylinder head. And I'm not sure why. I would assume that it has to do with ethanol. Maybe it has to do with oil. I'm not sure. I've been running Motorex in it since day one all the way through. I have noticed that over time I've been needing to richen up my ERM a little bit to stop it from detonating. This could certainly be why. Meanwhile, over here, there's a teeny, teeny little bit of play in this left side crank bearing. But as I've mentioned in other videos in the past, roller bearings can have a little bit of that play. This is just super minute, so I'm not worried about that at all. I've pulled the flywheel off. Doesn't look like there's any leakage in that seal. Everything's looking good in here. Now this is super interesting. I just pulled this cover off. Look at that red oil. So normally I change my oil after eight hours because that's when it starts to go black. At 88 hours, I installed some blood racing transmission oil, some 10W40. Jeff from Blood says that I should be able to double my oil change intervals before it starts turning black. I've been pretty skeptical, although I've seen some amazing things with blood racing oil in suspension fluids. I've never tried their engine oils or transmission oils. This red stuff is looking pretty good. I'm gonna do a reel on the transmission oil change. You can find that on Instagram or on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook, whatever. I'll post it everywhere. All right, let's skip to the good part. Let's see what we find. Okay, let's turn it upside down and get the coolant out. Nothing crazy looking in the cylinder. Got lots of crosshatch everywhere. See lots of premix there. It's looking good. Looks like a pretty normal amount of buildup on the power valve. I'll pull that apart. We'll get that piston out of there so we can have a better look at it. Look at that premix down there though. All over the piston too. Looks super nice. Now this is really what I want to see. I see some black in the middle there. A nice brown on the bottom of the piston. So that tells me that my jetting is very, very close. Detailed check on this rod here. It is tight. Nothing wrong there. Side to side, although Side to side play is okay. If you've felt thousands of these things, you get to know a bit of a feeling and this is nice and tight. No wear there, essentially no wear. Now having a look at the amount of premix that's in here, this is quite unprecedented for a TPI. There's always some premix there. If, if you look at the crank as I rotate it, you can get an idea for how much is in the bottom of the crankcase. And that is beautiful. There's no lubrication issue here whatsoever. Now, my bike isn't nearly stock. What I can say though is I have the injector relocation kit and I did not actually expect there to be this much more premix 
floating around all over the engine. I don't know how many TPIs I've done, but this one is the wettest inside that I've seen. And I think this is the only one that I've done that had the TSP injector relocation kit, which is, I would say, a strong case for the injector relocation kit on a TPI simply for longevity. Although I haven't seen TPIs have problems with longevity, but I really love to see this premix just coating the inside of the engine. That is very nice. And I think it's safe to say that it is due to the IRK. Okay, power valve is all apart. And I would say that this is on the nastier side of the spectrum. That is more buildup than I expect when I open up a TPI. Oh, I ran exclusively MotorX, the proper oil, and I did that deliberately from start to the first 100 hours. And now I'm switching over to the blood two-stroke oil. So if you follow me for the next 100 hours of bike use, which is probably gonna be like more than two years, realistically speaking, I'll have another report for you because I'll run exclusively blood for the next 100 hours. That being said, oil ratio and the type of oil is not the only thing that's gonna affect this buildup. It could have to do with the way that I've jetted the bike or set up the mapping. Could have to do with heat range of the plug or the way that I ride. It could be a whole bunch of different things. Interesting though. That buildup also makes me kind of wonder if this buildup is related to the type of oil that I'm running. Now let's get on to the two most important pieces of information as far as I'm concerned, about top end wear. I got 18 thou there. Ideally, it should be like 13, 14 thou, but I don't know what it was set up with at the factory. So now I'm gonna check piston clearance and that will tell me, because I know at the factory, this will be set up at two and a half thou. All right, I've got my bore gauge zeroed here. Just over five and a half thou. Let's check the bottom here. Yep, same. Just over five and a half, side to side, five and a half, right there. That's perfect. 100 hours, five and a half thou, which means that the piston has worn three thou off of its original skirt. Five and a half thou, that's pretty good. I could go a little further, but I would say 100 hours is right about bang on for my style of riding or how much wear that I put on the bike. Okay, I got the cylinder all reassembled and everything. Just checking clearance here. Got the bore gauge set to the new piston. Two and a half, very nice. Just over three. So we got just a little bit more than a half a thou deviation on the cylinder wall. That is quite normal. All right, fast forward 12 hours. Before I got started this morning, I kind of cleaned off my bench and reset, organized everything again. I often like to do that between disassembly and reassembly, just reorganize everything. I had a bunch of oil and coolant all over my bench. I don't like working like that. It gets my hands all messy. Oil is one thing, coolant, it's nasty. It just makes it so I can't properly grab and feel everything with my fingers. So here we are. If you want to see the full reassembly process on a cylinder like this, I didn't film it on this one, but I have a whole video exactly on how to do it. I'll put a link right here for it. I'll put the link in the description. Now I have checked ring end gap and we're too small. We're at about 12 thou. This is such a critical thing and it seems like it just keeps getting worse. I get ring end gaps that are all over the map nowadays. It's super important to check every single one. Now at 12 thou, it might not seize the rings, but it also might. Either way, you should set up your rings properly. I'm gonna go between 13 and 14 thou. I've got a ring grinder here. I use this thing all the time. They're only like 30 or 40 bucks. If you do top ends semi-regularly, just go buy one. You don't have to use a ring grinder. You can use a fine file or a stone or plenty of videos online showing you how to do that. I've got my ring here. I'm just gonna put this grinder at the edge of the bench. There's two little studs here. This does take a little bit of feel. You gotta make sure that the ring end gaps are lined up so you don't get a cockeyed cut. It takes a little bit of feel. I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna push this down now into the cylinder below where the maximum ring wear is, right near the top. So you wanna get it down, you know, 20 millimeters down into the cylinder. I'm gonna try 14 thou now. Perfect, 14 thou is a tight squeeze. Now I've got a die stone here that's all wore out and old like this. And I'm just gonna deburr the edge of this ring here where I cut it, that's good. Now my second one, 13 just barely fits. I'm just gonna take a quick little lick off of it here. Ah, it's still a little tight. I don't want 13 to be tight. Okay. There we go, 13's a little on the loose side. So 14, 14's got a bunch of drag. Okay, rings are set up. Got a new wrist pin bearing here, drop that in. Now I'm gonna go clean this base surface here. There's a bunch of clear silicone on here and I always get that off. So I've got this, little scraper tool here and I just just kind of push that silicone off here see there's a little bit of buildup of silicone over here just from assembly now this scraper here the way that I sharpen it is quite critical so 
I sharpen it this way first, and then I use a die stone, and you can see that I just relieve the back of it. That way the sharp edge isn't gonna dig down into the aluminum. I sharpen it with these die stones. So take a die stone, sharpen like that, and then the last step is I just knock the edge off like that. Now, final step for cleaning the gasket surface here, put a little bit of Varsol in this cup here. Now I keep the die stone wet like this. You just keep it nice and flat on the gasket surface. You don't wanna remove aluminum. You just wanna get rid of that gasket material. This is a 220 grit die stone. They're readily available at any like mold shop or machinist supply. All right, got that all cleaned up and wiped down. You can still see some of the ink on there, but it's nice and smooth, so I'm not gonna get too aggressive with that. I don't want to take away any of this material. Now, I always keep the old gasket. I measured it, it's actually 0.7 millimeters. Now, this is super important, especially if you have an aftermarket head like I do. When I installed the head, I was very particular. I set it up as per TSP's instructions at 1.2 millimeters. 95% of TPIs use a 0.6 millimeter gasket. If I would put a 0.6 mil in now, then my squish would be at like 1.1. I don't want it any tighter than 1.2. The last thing I want is to tighten up that squish anymore, cause more detonation so that I have to richen up my bike more or even do something like run av gas or race gas. I've got a variety of base gaskets here. These are just spares from kits that I have used to build motors in the past. So I'm gonna find a 0.5 and a 0.2, which will give me 0.7, we'll be good to go. There we go, 0.7. I actually used a 0.4 and a 0.3. Just stack up the two correct ones, away we go. Now the worst part of this job, getting these clips in here. These Pro-X ones are not nearly as bad as the KTM ones. The Vertex ones, oh yeah, man. Oh, these are way easier. Glad somebody wised up and realized that it wasn't necessary to use two millimeter thick piston clips. There we go. That was easy. I did a reel about this a little while ago where I put the first clip in. A lot of you mentioned that the second clip was more difficult. I disagree because the wrist pin is already in there. So I just started on one side, kind of put it through. I'm doing most of this with my thumb and a little bit with the needle nose, but I literally just pushed it in there. Now, admittedly, the Pro-X ones are easier than the Vertex ones, but that was definitely easier than the first one. Now, ring install, the little letter always goes up. Line up the ring end gaps with the pins, and work them around, trying not to scratch the piston. Bingo. Now I rotate the piston all the way down so I can get my cylinder in there. Now, just before I put the piston in, I've washed this cylinder with soapy water to make sure that none of my honing residue is in there. Basically, if you don't wash the cylinder with soapy water very thoroughly, you're just wearing out your rings prematurely because that honing grit is still in the cylinder. I don't know if you can see this, I just noticed it, but there's a tiny little flake off of my Nicosil in there. It's not a high spot. Nicosil is actually missing right there. I can just feel it with my fingernail. Now, I'm not concerned about that. It's been running just fine. And having porosity or little holes in your Nicosil, sometimes you'll even get that with a brand new plated cylinder, especially if you get your cylinders plated at US Chrome. Now, I don't really like the way that it looks. It makes me a little nervous. Basically, that little hole there, it's just gonna hold oil. It's not gonna hurt the rings. It's not gonna hurt compression. It's gonna be just fine. So I've got my cylinder all lubed up. Got my piston and my rings in place. Got my base gasket. Got my surfaces all cleaned. I cleaned the cylinder surface just like I did the base gasket. Now I'm just pressing the top ring together with my fingers, carefully working the cylinder over it. Now the bottom one, just kind of wiggle it. There we go. Don't force anything. There we go, just like that. A little bit of grease on the cylinder studs. I'm gonna lift up the power valve there so I can sneak this nut into there. Oh, I'm already getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna leave this a little bit loose. I'm gonna get this gasket into here because even now it might be quite difficult to get it in there. Okay, I got lucky, that one works. The Vertex gaskets are thicker than this. I'm actually reusing my OEM one. Oftentimes it's very difficult to get the gasket in between this little D seal and the cylinder. Uh, I'm not gonna to torque these because they're in an awkward spot and they really don't need to be torqued. You don't have to kill them. They're just M10 studs. Snug and then give them a little extra. Don't strip them. People ask me all the time, how tight do you put this? Tight enough so it doesn't come loose and not so tight that it strips. There you go. That's the torque spec. These are not super picky. I'm not super worried about them because they're kind of adjacent to the cylinder. 
the head studs I'm going to be way more picky with, and I've talked about this in other videos, because these studs are going to distort the cylinder a fair bit. These ones are not really going to distort the cylinder. With two and a half or three thou piston clearance, the distortion on this cylinder, that's taken up in that clearance to allow for distortion. And I know you guys get nervous when I don't cover up this hole. I've never dropped one in there, and if I do, I'll fix it. Now, this gasket cannot be trusted to hold oil, actually. And this is, transmission oil will come out of here. This is the transmission vent. It's often mistaken for a power valve vent. It's actually a transmission vent. I'm gonna put some 5910 in this groove. And I'm also going to put it all the way around here because they leak. Now, oftentimes I'm actually pretty comfortable reusing this O-ring, but I have got this bike pretty hot during my testing. Hottest I've seen is 263. This O-ring is a little bit flattened and I have lots of O-rings, so no sense doing that. Very nice. And I'm also gonna do this O-ring for the head insert. Ooh, it's kind of stuck. Yeah, this one's pretty flat. Got that new O-ring in there. I'm gonna drop this into there. And then I'm gonna thread my spark plug in because if you've done this before, you know that it's kind of a pain to install a two-piece head. And I'm going with a BPR8ES. The spark plug that TSP recommends is a BPR8EIX. The difference from stock is just that this one is a P, so it's got a projected tip on it. When I have put this P plug into a stock bike, I have noticed on some occasions that the bike runs hotter and it tends to detonate and the idle hangs up a little bit. So on the stock bikes, I put the stock plug in, but if you've got a TSP map or a TSP head, I go with their recommended plug. I don't have the iridium tip because those are way more expensive and I've never been able to tell a difference. Just line up those little cylinder studs. Now, a little bit of grease on the head bolts. I quickly do one on each side just to make sure that those O-rings don't get dislodged. Now, something that I forgot to mention is that whenever I'm doing a top end, I always have a look at the deck height. So the piston should basically come up flush with the cylinder. If it's protruding up or if it's down a noticeable amount, then I'm going to measure and I'm going to investigate. But mine was pretty much flat and I have set up the squish for this head so I'm not worried because I went with the same size base gasket. Now cylinder head studs, I am going to torque those. Torque wrench set at 19 already. 19 foot pounds that is. I've already snugged these up so they're probably already at like 13 or 14 foot pounds. Then I'm gonna go around and torque all the rest. Now I'm gonna go around and do it again. There you go. Now, because I just had this in here hand tight, I'm gonna tighten up that spark probe properly. I'm also gonna take and just make sure that this little cap is tight. I see those come loose pretty regularly. Hooking up the crankcase pressure sensor. I'm just gonna put a little dab of silicone on there onto that spigot. I'm gonna keep it back towards the cylinder because I don't want that hose to get blocked up by this silicone. You gotta be really careful. You don't want to use too much. I'm just gonna work it all the way around the spigot and that can go on. I don't know if you can see it, but it's just squishing out a little bit around the edge of the hose. And now this little spring clip thing onto there. Now yours will definitely be different here unless you're one of the few people that has this crankcase pressure sensor mount, but I'm gonna do this right away because you can see that that hose is spinning there and I wanna get it in place before the silicone dries. Of course, again, yours will be different because this is the injector relocation kit. And periodically I go and I tighten up these little clamps. I've found them to loosen over time a little bit and you get a fuel leak. And then there's one back in here for the secondary injector as well. I'm going to do this with my impact. You've heard me say this before. If you don't know your impact really well, don't do it like this. Look up the torque spec. Now I'm going to reuse this gasket. It's a metal gasket. This cavity doesn't need to hold oil or anything, so it's not super critical. Not like a clutch cover one or something. I'm not going to lube the Bendix. Checking these bushings and they're just fine. So I'm going to put this back together the way it is. You think about an automotive style Bendix, which is pretty much the same as this Bendix. They're even exposed to the elements. So to think that a dirt bike Bendix somehow needs lubrication or oil to last a long time doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You can put some chain lube on it or something if it makes you feel better. Again, I don't use a torque wrench on these. When people use a torque wrench on these little M6 bolts, there are so many variables that it's not accurate enough to do it with a torque wrench. It's better to do it by hand because you can feel when they start to strip. Now a little bit of blue Loctite, don't need much. A little 
green tape helps me remember, not that I would really probably forget this, but stick to your procedures and it will minimize mistakes. Same goes for this coolant temp sensor up on the head and the spark plug. Now I'm gonna put this little cross member back in. If you don't have one of these, you probably should. If you own a TPI, it is definitely recommended in my opinion to have an Emperor Racing rad guard because they will eliminate the chance of getting your left side rad hose pinched it's the best fix for that rad hose issue that i know of now this part will also be quite different for you because i have a weird rad hose system set up because i've got my c3 thermostat the only reason i'm running that is so that i can have a temp gauge in there normally during a top end i would check my clutch dampers and such but i have this thing apart all the time and i know that they're good right now so if you didn't see the results of what the transmission oil looked like i'll put a little link here you can click it and you can see that the results were pretty incredible. I'm definitely going with the same oil again. Blood Racing, Scorpion Blood, 10W40. I'll put a link in the description too. All right, one, two, skip a few. We're back together. Figured you guys probably wouldn't want to watch me put the tank on. That's pretty simple. One thing you'll notice is that this bench has nothing on it. This bench, just doing the final cleanup on it. So I got my old piston. It has one clip in there. Something that I always verify is that I only have one extra clip. That way I know. Both of them are in there. Ask me why I have that procedure. On an oil injected bike, I would add some premix to the tank, but I'm already running premix, so no need for that. Got the rad cap still off, even though I'm full and I've spilled a little bit. Now it's time to fire it up. Okay, first fire up. Have not hit the button yet. Very common sound with the injector relocation kit. There we go. There we go, one heat cycle done. Now I'm gonna go test ride the bike. So hopefully that was a little bit more interesting than a standard how to change a piston video. If you like it, I would appreciate if you let the algorithm know with a thumbs up. If you wanna see more content like this, go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you wanna see what I'm doing on a more day-to-day -day basis, you can find that content on Instagram. Thanks a lot for watching.